الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين Welcome brothers and sisters thank you for joining me um, tonight i would like to briefly revisit a topic that we spoke about a few days ago and tie it to a subject which is going to be particularly pertinent in the next few days so let me begin first of all preface what i want to really talk about by revisiting uh, the topic that we spoke about previously and that topic that we pro- spoke about previously was that we mentioned in a halaqa which we entitled be careful from whom you take religious knowledge we mentioned the statement of umar ibn al-khattab radiyallahu anhu who said zallatu alim zallatu alam he said the error of a scholar results in the error of entire nations and we mentioned that what that basically means is that seldom does a scholar a learned person a person who has gained a certain level of notoriety prestige celebrity fame and people listen to what he says takes his knowledge make a mistake except that his mistake transcends himself and impacts his contemporaries in large numbers and in many cases it impacts generations to come people beyond his contemporaries seldom is his mistake and the effects of it restricted to himself and there's a few things that let's contemplate this statement of Umar radiyallahu an and some of the implications of it one thing is that it teaches us that the scholars in spite of their um massive amounts of knowledge they err they make mistakes and there's no blame on them it's human to err as the prophet some said the prophet some as the prophet some said in the hadith kullu bani adam khata all of the sons of adam all the human beings make mistakes it's human to err is human kama yuqal but these scholars they do err and since they err because they are human because since they don't always get it right since they do make mistakes we have the right to scrutinize and to basically try to make sure that whatever they're telling us and whatever information they're giving us and we're consuming it that we have to try to make sure that it's right because they're human beings and they can err they have the propensity to err the third thing that we can take from take away from the statement of Umar radiyallahu an is that it's not proper for us to follow their mistakes knowingly or if we have a strong suspicion a strong inkling that they've said something erroneous we can't follow it simply because they are scholars notice on what he said zallatu alim zallatu alim the mistake or the error of the scholar is also an error for the one who follows him it's not correct because the scholar said it, it also automatically it's wrong for him but it come it becomes right for us that's another thing that we can take away from what uh omar said so now if you understand this you understand that we are required to follow the truth to follow what's right and not to follow the scholars if we suspect or if we know for certain that they're wrong we're not allowed to do that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum bir rabbikum wa la tattabi'u min dunihi awliya allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says follow what has been revealed to you from your lord the divine truth contained in the quran and the hadith wa la tattabi'u min dunihi and do not follow instead of it um awliya people that you love people you admire people who you respect and look up to the scholars meaning that when you're put in a situation where the divine guidance is saying a and the statement of the scholar is saying b something contradictory and not in keeping with the evidence you have no right to follow the scholar instead of the evidence you have to follow the evidence Well, you ekkid that and this is confirmed by a practical example 
from the life of Ibn Abbas, the great companion and scholar of our religion, who once, during the Hajj season, was speaking to different people and giving them advice and guidance about Al-Hajj, the pilgrimage, the great ritual rites of pilgrimage. So some of the people, they asked him about Hajj at Tamattu'a, a particular form of pilgrimage. Told him not only is this acceptable, permissible, prescribed, form of hedge. So those people, and he basically told them that this is what the prophet said. This is what the prophet encouraged people to do. And when he said that, the people responded and said, but Abu Bakr and Umar, they disallow it. They don't permit it. So what do you say about that? So Ibn Abbas, he has a famous response to this. He says, Yushiku an tanzila alaykum hijaratum min sama." أقول قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وتقولون قال أبو بكر وعمر. He said, I fear that stones are about to rain down upon your heads from the heavens. I say, the messenger of Allah said, and you respond, but Abu Bakr and Umar said. Ibn Abu saying it's appropriate that once Allah and His messenger have spoken, that we contradict a statement of someone else even if it's Abu Bakr and Umar. We know who these two men are. We know they're the most knowledgeable of the Prophet's companions and they are his two successors. And they are the people about whom the Prophet said, he said, he said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnatul khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdini min ba'di. Follow my sunnah and follow the sunnah of the right they got a caliph after me. And they're the first two of them. He also said, If the people obey Abu Bakr and Umar, they'll be guided. But even then, Ibn Abbas said that they can't, be, they can't be followed instead of Allah or in spite of what Allah and His Messenger have said. And this is the case for Abu Bakr and Umar. It is certainly the case for those who are less than them. Which brings me to my next point. And that is that... Um... And that is that because of this, we have to be careful. Which was the whole point from the previous talk that we gave. We have to be careful. We have to be careful whom we take knowledge from. And we have to be careful with the knowledge that we're consuming. Verifying its authenticity and its correctness. And people should not by any means belittle the importance of trying and striving to ascertain authenticity. People should not put that down. Because we are, we are created to follow the truth. We're created. We just talked about that. And we mentioned the statement related to this, the statement of Muhammad ibn Sirin, who said famously, he said, Inna hadha ilma ilmu amman He said, this knowledge is a knowledge of the religion of Allah, so be careful from whom you take your knowledge. Now, why do I say all this? I say all this to preface what I want to really talk about, and that is that we live in a time now, because of the lockdowns and stay-at-home orders and shelter-in-place orders, where... A lot of us are not going to be able to go to the, mas the, the masajid. Some of us may not be able to go for the whole of Ramadan, and many of us will not be able to go for a large part of it, maybe the first two weeks of it, etc. And here we are at the end of this week, inshallah, ta'ala, Ramadan is going to begin. And many people are concerned about Salat al -Tarawiyah. What are we going to do? Love. Many of us find a great deal of... Um, of pleasure this prayer has a certain sweetness to it many people long for this prayer they wait the whole year to be able to go to the mosque and pray tarawih in jama'ah in in congregation and many people are concerned what is going to happen to tarawih under these circumstances and so you have all these fatawa that are floating around now telling people um some of these unorthodox methods of offering tarawih Advising people, for example, to um, tune in to Facebook Live to a particular masjid. The masjid could be in their city. They're in the house and they're in, in the masjid in the city, but they're at home following that. Some people will say it could be another state, could be another country altogether. Right? Some people say you could turn your phone on and play the recitation of a qari, 
and follow that. You're going to have all these alternative ways that people are giving you to um, to pray Tarawiyah. And so I wanted to say a few things about dates to what we talked about just a few moments ago about being careful from whom we take our knowledge and what knowledge we consume and what knowledge we follow. So the first thing I want to mention is that the first priority for every Muslim when it comes to the rites and rituals in general and a salat prayer in particular is qubul al-amal. The first thing that should be on our mind, the first thing that we should be concerned about as Muslims is making sure that our deed is going to be accepted. We are not doing these deeds and exerting ourselves, exerting energy, taking the time out to do these deeds for them to be rejected. We want them to be accepted. We want Allah's reward for these deeds. We want these deeds to be a vehicle and a means for us to attain Allah's pleasure, His forgiveness, and His paradise. We're not doing this just because we don't have anything better to do. We want it to be accepted. And we have to understand that in order for the deed to be accepted, it has to be done in the way it was legislated, prescribed. We can't do it however we want and then think it's going to be accepted. The Prophet, the Prophet he said in the Hadith of Aisha, he said, Man amila amalan, amruna fahuwa, rad. Whoever does a deed, a religious act, and he doesn't do it the way we prescribed, it will be rejected. Do you want your deed to be rejected? Nobody wants their deed to be rejected. You're not praying. You're not praying salat tarawiyah. Spending an hour, an hour and a half, two hours praying to Allah, begging Allah, crying to Allah to have that thrown back in your face. That? And so the first thing we need to have on our mind, I want this deed to be accepted. How's it going to be accepted? Making sure I do it right. I have to do it correctly. I can't do it any kind of way and then say, Allah Kareem, he better get that. No, Allah is not, not obligated to, do any, to, to give us anything, to accept anything. We need to make the deed acceptable. The onus is on us. But the second thing, is that we should not pay attention to because we talked about being careful. Be careful when you take your knowledge, what knowledge you're consuming, where it's coming from, and what it is, scrutinizing it. You should not pay attention to a person to, to, to fatawa, where a person is telling you do this, do that, and they're telling you you can do this and do that because so and so said, and they're not telling you who so and so is. They're not telling you saying some Hanafi, some Maliki, some who are these Hanbalis and Malikis? Who are they? I need to know who they are. We're the people of Isnad. We're the people who are going to be asked about this prayer and we need to have an answer for Allah about our prayer. So there are two problems with this. If a person just said, hey, some people said. Some people said it's okay. And then you just do it because some people said and you don't know who those some people are. There's two problems with that. One is that if you don't know who or why. I don't know who said it and I don't know why they said it. What was their justification? What was their delil, their evidence? then you can't be sure it's credible. And if you can't be sure it's credible, because understand, a scholar said does not make it credible. As the scholars have a qa'idah, they say, كَلَامُ الْعُلَمَاءَ يُحْتَجُّ لَهُ وَلَا يُحْتَجُّ بِهِ The statement of a scholar, we need proof to support it, and it's not a proof in of itself. So just because they say a Hanbali scholar said, or the Hem some of the Hanbali said, or some of the Hanafi said, or some of the Maliki said, that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it right, doesn't make it something you can follow. If you don't know who or why, that doesn't make it automatically credible. I need to, I need to know who said it, I, don't, I need to know why they said it. That's the first problem with it. The second thing is, is that this is something that we ourselves, we wouldn't accept. We wouldn't accept it for ourselves, so why should we expect Allah to accept it? Why should we accept, and I'm going to give you an example, a practical example. Let's say that one of us owns a company. And you hire someone to do a specific task a specific way. That you have a business, you're running a business, and you're trying to make money, you're trying to make a profit. And you hire someone to do a specific task a specific way, and the, and, and the, the results, the outcome of, their, the, the, of the doing of this task will directly affect your bottom line. So you're relying on this person to do X and to do it this way. So then that person, you come... And they haven't done what you asked. And what they have done, they haven't done it the way you asked. And now this is going to have repercussions on your bottom line. And so you ask the person, okay, I told you exactly what I wanted you to do. I told you exactly the way I wanted you to do it. Why didn't you do that? And he said, well, so-and-so said 
that such and such said, that's not necessary. I don't have to do it like that. And then you ask him, who said? I don't know. Why did they say it? I don't know. Would you accept that as the boss who's now going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars from your bottom line because so-and-so decided to do something differently than the way you told him because so-and-so told him that so-and-so said. And he can't even tell you why they said it or who said it. Would you accept that as the boss? No, you wouldn't accept that. We wouldn't accept it. Why do we expect Allah to accept it? Why do we expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to meet Allah and he's going to ask us about our prayer. As the Prophet said in, this, in the hadith, he said, The first thing a slave is going to be asked about on the day of resurrection is his prayer. Allah is going to ask us, what's up with this prayer? And what are we going to say? Oh, I did it this way because so-and-so said that such and such had said. That's what you're going to say to Allah. You wouldn't accept it for yourself. Why do you want Allah to accept it? Do you want Allah? Do you want to take the chance? That's another thing too. Do you want to take the chance? Maybe Allah will accept it. Maybe he won't. Do you want to take that chance? Why not do it the way you certain that Allah will accept it and then get your prayer accepted for certain. Be certain when you finish your prayer, Allah is going to accept this prayer. Bi-idhnillah. So with that, I want to come to three things. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, a few points about tarawiyah and then close with some advice about what we should do if we're shut in and unable to go to the masjid this Ramadan or parts of it. So the first thing is there's some things we need to understand and there are big misconceptions amongst the Muslims about Tarawiyah that lead to this, 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 this anxiety about not being able to offer it in the masjid. The first thing we have to understand is that the Prophet Sallallahu he prayed Tarawiyah in the masjid with the Muslims twice in his lifetime. Twice in his lifetime did the Prophet Sallallahu pray Tarawiyah leading the Muslims in the masjid and congregation. It only happened twice. It was not the Prophet's regular practice, nor that of his companions during his lifetime, to pray tarawih in the masjid. Is it a sunnah? Yes, it is a sunnah because the Prophet did do it. But we have to understand that tarawih and the masjid do not necessarily go hand in hand. They're not part and parcel. If you don't have one, you can't have the other. That misconception has to be removed from our minds. You can pray tarawih in your home. In fact, the asal, the original rule, the standard is to pray it in your home. And the masjid is the exception to the rule. The second thing is that the Prophet's companions, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim, they used to make after his passing during the Khilaf of Umar and then afterwards on down uh, the line of history, they did pray tarawiyah in congregation in the masjid together. But when they did, they didn't do it with the intention of making khatam al-Qur'an, completing the Qur'an, the entire Qur'an in tarawiyah. They didn't do that. That they would bring a reciter, they would pick someone who was uh, skilled in the recitation of the Qur'an, and that person would just recite. He would recite at his leisure, he would cite, recite on his own volition, whatever he wanted to recite, and they would recite for long periods of time, Walaikum Salaam wa Barakatuh, but they did not have the intention of completing the recitation in Ramadan. They just would recite. So that's another misconception. A lot of us think, well, you can't make tarawih unless you're going to recite the whole Qur'an. And some people struggle. They struggle, or they, they, they struggle, they don't know the whole Qur'an. And if they were to read it from the Mus'haf, they would struggle, they would make mistakes. They're not that proficient. And some of them, they don't feel comfortable in their madhab and the school of thought that they follow and what they've been always taught is that you're not supposed to hold the Mus'haf while you're reading Qur'an. I'm sorry, while you're praying. So all those things become obstacles to them. Why? Because they're in the impression, I have to do the whole Qur'an if I'm going to do tarawiyah. They don't go hand in hand. They don't. You can read anything in tarawiyah, and that's what the early Muslims used to do. The third point, as it relates to tarawiyah, is that it's confirmed from Uthman ibn Affan that he actually prayed the night prayer on occasion, at least once, and maybe more than once. He prayed the night prayer reciting one ayah from the Qur'an. He stood the whole night in prayer, and all he recited was one ayah. And that was the ayah from Surah Yusuf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Indeed, to Allah, I, 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 com I complain of my, my sadness, my sorrow, my difficulty. I put that in the hands of Allah. I complain to Allah about that, etc. He just kept repeating that ayah over and over again. 
and will have you akid this further emphasizes and confirms the fact that you don't have to recite the whole Quran in tarawih in the night prayer you can recite anything if all you know is qul huwa allahu ahad you can recite qul huwa allahu ahad and keep repeating it over and over and over again and that is tarawih and it might be accepted even more so than the person who is going out of their way to recite a lot of the Quran without what ta'ammul without concentrating and having khushu'ah and reflecting upon the meaning and their heart really isn't involved because they're too busy what? Um, looking and reading and concentrating on what they're reading instead of um, the meaning of what they're reading and letting that meaning affect them and pass over their heart and impact them, etc. So that said, I'll bring me to the last and final point. And I know I've gone a little bit longer than we usually do, but this, because of the importance of it, I really want to make sure this was clear, is that my recommendation... Uh, is that those of us who are shut in, stuck at home, can go to the masjid to offer tarawih, that we pray at home, in jama'ah, in congregation with our families. And we read whatever we are able to read from the Qur'an, based upon what we know of the Qur'an, and those who feel comfortable reading from the mushaf can do so. Those who don't feel comfortable, just read what you have memorized, even if it's a small amount. And the thing about this suggestion that I'm giving you is it's a suggestion that no scholar from any madhab will say is wrong. And we talked about it earlier about wanting to do the thing that we know will be accepted. We're going to be asked about this prayer. And we want to meet Allah and be able to be confident that He's going to accept it and we're going to have an acceptable answer when we meet Him. So this is my advice, brothers and sisters. You can take it or leave it. But the one thing that I want you to, to take away from everything that we said is that whatever you're going to follow, whoever you're going to follow, whatever they say, they are obligated to be able to substantiate what they're saying with proof. And you cannot just use the fact that X scholar said as a justification to do whatever you want to do. But rather, we are not sent on this earth to follow scholars per se. We're sent on this earth to follow the truth and the scholars are supposed to be a means toward that end and not an end in and of themselves. With that, I bring it to a close. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an yanfa'ana bima allamana wa an yu'allimana ma yanfa'una. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from what, with what we learned and to teach us what is beneficial. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who offer this tarawih in whatever way we possibly can, whether at home or in the masjid. And that we do it in the way that He accepts and that He accepts it and rewards us beyond forgiveness, beyond heavy scales. He rewards us with Jannah, paradise on the day of judgment. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.